Welcome to the Four Ps, episode 114. And it's great to be with you. And by with you, I obviously don't mean with you, with you. But hopefully my engagement with your senses and your sensibilities will help to stave off those pangs of loneliness, at least for like the next 10 minutes or so. In case you missed it, and if you follow me on social media and watch these videos, I doubt you could have, we're now in the we made a music video stage of the worst family quarantine. My kids don't really know about our performance side. My wife and I, as kids growing up, or as musicians and thespians, as karaoke stars in our single 20s. So this was fun, taking the mundane, monotonous process of doing laundry and turning it into a parody video. And it just kind of came out of my wife's lips one morning. I'm tired of the never-ending laundry. And like, immediately I sprinted across the house, popped up and ran to the laundry room, and the idea was born. It certainly beats the alternative, right, to quarantine boredom. And that's my personal P. Exercising. The number of people talking about Pelotons and going for runs and DIY workouts is also never ending. And I'm just not at the phase of mental duress where I want to flip the physical fitness switch. Not yet. I'm someone who's fluctuated between extremes intense health and fitness with limited calorie diets on one end, and then completely not giving a shit on the other. And that's kind of where I am and have been for the past year or so. It's basically been about just doing whatever it is that I want to do. But I'm getting to the point where it's almost time to care again, especially since COVID is worse for people who aren't physically healthy. But for now, we'll stick with parody videos. And many views later on YouTube, my kids now want to be YouTube celebrities. And I've created a beast that may not be containable. So we're already on to the next video production. Stay tuned. something professional, which could also be something physical in terms of location, the number of posts and predictions and think pieces on the demise of The Office are just overwhelming. I even read something this week called The Office is Dead, but to I don't know, misquote a popular cliche, reports of its demise are fucking dumb. Yes, many people are enjoying the opportunity to work from home, to break down the traditional structures of how we work. I mean, we work basically collapsed before the pandemic, but commercial real estate is facing dire times and may ahead, it, it could be grim. But the question is, is this new way really the best way? I'd argue that the risks of contagion notwithstanding, and hopefully those will subside, the pros of being together in a physical space outweigh the cons of being together. Organic conversation, company culture, the importance of just socializing, breaking up the routine. These are important for many companies and businesses. Sure, not all and maybe some companies with employees spread out can make this work, but it's more the exception than the norm. And it requires levels of discipline that many people just don't possess don't have the physical ability to make it happen, whether it's roommates or kids or whatever. Some may not return to an office model, right? And that's okay. It's gonna depend on the industry and even the company. Big companies with thousands of employees may disproportionately influence and tip the balance. And then the lack of demand for commercial real estate is gonna have major effect in big cities as well as for residential buildings that need to support those workers. But in a creative industry, which I'm in, I found that people do fuel and feed off each other. And that energy is hard to replace virtually. We're proving that we can do it without a footprint for now, but I'm not confident it can last, nor that I want it to last. As a parent, the spouse of a healthcare professional, yes, I need to get out of the house. I am finding ways to work here, but it's getting harder and my patience is growing, like my hairline, thinner. Of course, this may all change once our kids go back to school, if they ever go back to school. 
Something practical. You can't touch this. If I was going to invest in anything at the moment, it would be contactless technology development. It's already taking off in terms of mobile payments, and I've been using contactless payment services like Venmo and Square and even PayPal for like a decade, thanks to my massive NCAA tournament pool and other sports and related gambling habits. But I remember the first touch and go credit cards like 15 years ago in the drugstores in the subway, but they haven't really become widely accepted for some reason. That may change as more businesses reopen, at least everywhere but New York. Customers will use contactless tools to place orders and buy goods and businesses will use them to put their customers' infection anxieties at ease. I mean, cash is gross. Think about it. And even handing your credit card to someone in a restaurant seems impossible to, to, to just like conceive of at the moment. But what about other areas where we need to keep our distance? Door handles, right? Elevator buttons, please. What about playgrounds or train seats for commuters and other places where people touch things? I know we all just need to wash our hands and be smart, but that's not always gonna be possible when you're out and about running around. Hand sanitizer can only go so far as we've seen. So what contact solution or contactless solution can you think of? I wanna hear it. And something political. There is a divide in America, not a surprise. It's always been there. And one, one of the foundations of actually of our country and how it was formed, remember it took several key compromises just to ratify the constitution. But selective media consumption has exacerbated this divide. But instead of it falling along traditional party lines, it's very much rooted in the differences between fact and opinion. And just like the divide on issues like gun safety and climate change before, the differences with respect to COVID-19 and the infection rate can be actually tied to fact-based knowledge, and it can be measured. Last week, the University of Chicago in Illinois announced the results of a study that they did finding more COVID-19 cases and deaths uh, in the early stages of the, of the pandemic with respect to viewers of Fox News host Sean Hannity who downplayed the pandemic for the first like six weeks, even compared to those who watched another Fox News host, Tucker Carlson, who to his credit, warned of the threat posed by COVID as early as February. Uh, February. Now, the results suggest that in mid-March, after Hannity's shift in tone a little bit, and when Fauci and others were being put out there by Trump, the diverging trajectories of COVID-19 cases also began to revert, but it was too little too late, you stupid fucks. Carlson was in the minority on his own network for a month. Right when Fox News is the most watched cable network in the United States, and half of its audience is over the age of 65. Many of its television shows and personalities downplayed the threat of coronavirus and thus received harsh criticism for ignoring a public health crisis. Putting even more science into this test, which I know might rub some of those viewers the wrong way. In a phase two, we should be looking at and adding in more control-based groups to these two variables, right? And as a control, you could probably look at any other media content, but I'd recommend CNN's Sunday morning news show, Reliable Sources, or NBC's Meet the Press, which put fact-based reporters in the position of emphasizing and prioritizing facts over opinions. If you want to call that an opinion show, you'd be wrong, but at least you see some editorializing. That would be as scientific as it gets. And in this day and age, science is often the only thing that is keeping us alive.